Thank you. <coughs> well, I think we can refine uh, the selection at least uh, at four different levels. Number one, uh, considering TNN subcategories, something that is not so well recognized in general. Number two, uh, by implementing uh, the classical as, uh, as well as the newer pathological molecular factors. Uh, number three, liquid biopsy. And then at a less impactful level, we can consider the idea results in terms of deciding uh, which regimen and how long uh, to treat adjuvantly uh, stage three. And then I will go back to the clinical practice after uh, this, uh, at the end of these four points. So why are we discussing the need for refinement? <clears throat> Essentially because uh, several times what we do in our clinical practice uh, is uh, deceiving patients. We don't want to deceive patients, uh, but essentially what, what is being taught to us uh, is that 50% uh, of stage three will be cured, and if we provide the uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, we will we'll extend uh, this 50% by an additional 20%. That is in general true, but that's not true for every stage three patient. So the first level of refinement uh, even dates back to 10 years ago with this Gunderson paper on the JCO <clears throat> that highlighted that there are at least 10 subcategories within stage three. So that's refinement already. Spanning between outcome leading to long-term disease-free survival in 25% of cases up to 80% of cases. So that's a strong refinement of uh, uh, the selection of a patient. <clears throat> the second level is, if I have these uh, outcomes with just a T and N, why don't I add the classical uh, pathological factors, uh, such as uh, grading, number of nodes uh, taken out, uh, tumor budding, whatever, or the newer one? And I'm going just to project uh, the impact of, the, uh, of three of these uh, newer uh, ways uh, of assessing risk that unfortunately are just prognostic. So you should look at these uh, new factors uh, as something that should correct uh, each of those bars. So the first is tumor deposit. I'm just uh, reviewing three abstracts from, from ASCO this year as newer ways <clears throat> of refined prognosis. The message, 10% delta won't make it. Thank you. 10% <clears throat> delta <coughs> overall. Now just think of that. Will that change our attitude in prescribing chemo? Well, maybe we will see at the end. Second point. Stem-like stem subtype, again, has been uh, uh, proposed by the French group and again has a, a, a prognostic, okay, has a prognostic uh, uh, relevance uh, there, about, again, 10%. However, this factor has also a predictive role in terms of uh, a potential resistant to oxaliplatin in the adjuvant setting. So this would be a, a very nice lead for further research. <clears throat> Third example, the immunoscore. Again, 10% delta between the high and intermediate or intermediate and low. And again, with that change my, my decision. Okay. So the common theme out of uh, the classical pathological factors except for TNN, okay, G3, uh, perforation, uh, uh, number of nodes and so on, is that impact on the Gunderson uh, bar graph by about 10%. But we have uh, the third level of refinement now and that is liquid biopsy. 
See this tumor deposit may account for 10%, stem like another 10%, immunoscore another 10%. Unfortunately, they are not, uh, we cannot sum them up. More research could be done in that direction. Okay. But when we come to differences of 40, 60 percent, then this may really impact on our decision, no matter whether this is uh, predictive. <laughs> the simple fact that it is such a strongly prognostic factor may impact uh, on our clinical uh, decision making. So that, for example, these are stage three patients, uh, okay, if you are in this condition here, you may be tempted not to get, uh, that is, uh, circulating DNA negative. You may be tempted to de-escalate the treatment. So just a few, for example. Whereas if you are kind of desperate, still potential for cure, but 80% chances of dying, of recurring and dying, you may be tempted to escalate the therapy. And these are two examples. This is the dream team uh, uh, approach that highlight the fact that every stage three is treated with standard of care adjuvant, then liquid biopsy, and if negative, of course, just observation. How about if it is positive? If it is positive, you may have 80, 90% chances of, of recurring and dying. And therefore, therefore, they are exploring full theory or uh, uh, observation versus uh, if MSI high, nivolumab, if BRAF, uh, the beacon. And this is uh, to escalate in case uh, the risk is very high. How about the de-escalate? This is the proposal uh, within the IDEA group that we discussed about a month ago. Say that you select just uh, the T1, uh, T1, T1, T2, N1. So chances of being cured with the surgery alone in that case is already 70, 75%. Now think if you get a circulating DNA negative condition <clears throat> on top of these T and N characteristics, you're going to be cured in 90% of cases. So you may be willing just to go on to the experimental arm and no treatment. <clears throat> So these are two examples. There is a fourth level <clears throat> that to me impact much less than this, uh, than the, the, the categories that I have uh, described. And that's uh, the consideration of uh, uh, treatment duration as well as uh, the regimen. These are the uh, idea results for stage three. 13,000 patients. And uh, statisticians uh, tell us uh, that these curves are different. Um, my, uh, I, I would invite you to just uh, think uh, if the red uh, line was a new drug as opposed to, to the white lines uh, being the standard of treatment, would you conclude that that is better or would you consider that those are the same? Okay, but we are in the adjuvant setting, so maybe 1% may make the difference. And this is what has generated all the debate. Nevertheless, the beauty of clinical research is that you start to, uh, say, reject an all hypothesis that is demonstrating something that you want to demonstrate, and you end up in a totally different direction. Meaning that what we found within the idea was that the risk is important in terms of duration of treatment. That is, if you are N2 or T4 and you get only three months of therapy, you may lose up to four, three, four percent. Is that relevant in the face of six times less neurotoxicity? You should discuss it with your patients, but should be aware of these data. Whereas if you are in the great majority, 70% of cases, low risk, there is no difference whatsoever between three and six months. Therefore, you go for three months of treatment. And the second unexpected finding, again, beauty of clinical research, okay, 
was the fact that everybody of us uh, thought uh, that <coughs> K-pox or Fallfox were the same. Instead, K-pox really produces identical results. And Fallfox, well, you may be losing uh, 2 to 3 percent if you give three months of fall fox as opposed to giving six months. But we are discussing really small differences, extremely small differences. <coughs> so let's go back with our mind to what we practice every day with our patients. What do they want to know? Number one, what are my chances of being cured after the surgery alone? Number two, how much can I add if, I be, if I'm treated with a few alone? Number three, how much can I add if I use three months of oxaliplatin? And number four, what about six months of oxali? Well, there is no way to answer to the first question, unfortunately, because you can go back to the 80s and see the control arm, how it went. However, stage migration, better way of uh, uh, treating patients uh, surgically, better staging ways. You cannot use uh, those figures. So uh, within uh, the IDEA group and with a very nice uh, uh, intuition by our statistician, Dr. Paolo Bruzzi, we developed a model with a lot of assumptions, okay, working backward, uh, starting from the recent uh, IDEA data. <clears throat> So we developed a meta-regression model to predict the three-year disease-free survival and projected that to five years, and then worked backward, subtracted the effect of oxali, and then the effect of fluoropyrimidines. Again, it's a sort of very complicated, but generates a tremendously clear picture, which is this one. It was just submitted yesterday to the JCO. That's why I'm presenting this. Okay, here are the T and N categories <clears throat> of stage three. And for clarity, I simplified the picture, the, the slide, limiting it to eight categories, but we have this on 16 categories. So we are getting very close to the individualization of treatment. And this is what, is, what are the figures of cure, say long-term uh, disease-free survival with the surgery alone. You can already discuss these data with your patients. Uh, this is what I have been doing in the last uh, six months with our patient. And I see a tremendous effect on our clinical shared decision making. 83% chances of being cured with the surgery alone in the T1 and 1A group. Okay, and you wonder, maybe I can get by with no chemo even without circulating DNA assessment. Whereas look at the, what the model predicts for T4 and 2, 3%. Okay, so the next question is, how much do you gain with the fluorouracil alone? And that's what you gain in, this, in the different categories. How about adding oxaliplatin for three months? That much. And how about you adding oxaliplatin for six months? Again, that's a model derived. So we think this is a, a quite a useful way of discussing uh, uh, <clears throat> these data with, uh, with our patients. So can we refine the selection? for adjuvant treatment in stage uh, uh, three colon cancer? The answer is definitely yes. Start from the T and N based prognosis within stage three. With the model, without the model, well, the differences are just a 5% probably across these 16 categories. It is the science that requires some modeling uh, and uh, to see how well they compare with the actual data. And we are in the process of refining further this model uh, by implementing the other 30,000 data coming from the Accent database. <clears throat> so, but again, do not ignore the fact that, that stage three does mean 50% chances of being cured with the surgery alone. It means between 10% and 85%. Okay, then try to refine this using common sense because maybe the big data technology 
<coughs> machine learning will allow us to integrate the immunoscore, the oncotype DX, uh, the um, tumor deposits, uh, and all the other uh, classical and newer pathological determinants uh, into refining these bars defined by the TNN sta substaging uh, already available. Number three, of course, the future is in the hands of liquid biopsy. Then, use your clinical judgment and, above all, share decision-making to decide for, and I'm talking of stage three, A, no treatment. You may end up with patients wanting no treatment. No treatment. Fluoropyrimidines only, doublets for three months, doublets for six months, or even more intensive treatment regimens. Thanks very much for your attention.